Chapter 3, What Lies Beneath I was balancing Sylvia's journal on my knees and reading while savoring a cup of tea during a quick breakfast. In the past, I hadn't been much of a breakfast person, but Celeste insisted I needed to eat. Because of course she did. I was certain my recovery was complete, but she still had a habit of hovering or checking in on me. She sometimes did it to others as well, so I assumed it was just part of her personality. Either way, I had given in and was at least having some toast. Alone, as I usually did. But at least I was downstairs in the lobby where there were others around. Jack was nowhere to be seen, as was usually the case in the mornings these days. I'd already got used to not seeing him until late afternoon at the earliest. He had sneaked me out for walks a couple of times already, which was almost becoming a habit of ours. Aww. But he wasn't the only one I was spending time with these days. I was slowly learning everyone else's names as well. And I was starting to get more involved in things at Cordis. There were rotations for a lot of things here. Cooking, cleaning certain areas. I had battled my way to being able to help out. It was partially because I was tired of sitting around, and partially because I desperately wanted to feel... like I was part of something again. Some were cautious about interacting with me, but I'd come to realize trust was a rare resource here. Not without reason. I'd taken the approach of just existing in their space and letting them come up to me. It was less stressful than walking up to a conversation only to have it instantly shrivel under the weight of awkward greetings. Well, and I'd been offering to help at any available chance. I think that earned me at least some points. Even if people weren't lining up to get to know me, I was enjoying being around others. I set the cup on the round table in front of me and slid a finger down the side of the tablet, flipping to the next page. My eyes skimmed down the text as I read. The lesson on cages was interesting today, but I'm not sure I fully agree with what was taught. Maybe I've got used to viewing this in a different way, but I believe a cage is our greatest weapon despite not being an offensive technique. Our instructor described a cage as sectioning off something within our sphere and confining it with our psi. They said it is primarily used when searching, but this is where I disagree. I feel as though I can't always say things like this in class, because it flies in the face of what others understand about Psy. They all learn Psy from books and training, while I learned it on the streets of Delphine. That experience lends itself to a different understanding sometimes. And I'm a queen rank. I can perceive Psy on a deeper level than others, though if I say that, it probably comes across as pretentious. But I talked to Ronnie about it after class, and she agreed my description sounds accurate. Since she's a bishop, maybe her understanding of the cage concept is a little deeper too. A cage is usually referenced in terms of sight-based abilities, but I think it's used much more frequently and more naturally than many espers realize. When I want to use telekinesis on an object, I cage it within my psi, capturing and confining it. This lets me manipulate my psi to move or lift it. When I want to hit something with a psi burst, I've learned I can cage it, so my attack homes in on that object and is more likely to hit. And when I want to find something, I release my reverse cage, imagine the cage around what I'm looking for, and my psi instinctively seeks it out to pinpoint its location. Most people think of expanding their sphere, and maybe that's a more convenient way to think. But we're really releasing the stop we put on our own awareness. It's not our sphere that changes, but our reverse cage. That's my personal theory, anyway. When I envision the concept of a cage this way, I realize I use cages all the time, for almost everything. I think rooks use this concept when they apply biokinesis to their senses, but I don't think they view things in these terms. In the end, it's all the same thing. If we understood this, I wonder if our knowledge and application of Psy would expand. Hmm, that was all very interesting. I really like Sylvia's thoughts. 
I'd already learned a small amount about cages from a conversation I'd had with Jack about how we were expecting me to be able to hide here. With the prevalence of espers like bishops, who I felt should be able to locate me easily, I wasn't sure how secure my location was. We'd been located at the cafe and at that vivarium, after all. Jack said the court used artificial and organic reverse cages to protect quarters from psychic intrusions. Reading what Sylvia wrote put Jack's explanation into proper context so I could understand a little better. Not that it was impossible to break through any sort of cage from what I understood, especially the artificial ones. That being the case, I felt I should master both techniques if I wanted to not be found. Fortunately, the journal talked about that as well. I found it curious how much about using Psy came down to visualization and mental images. The journal had a section where Sylvia outlined her methods for focusing and clearing her thoughts. It came out of nowhere since she had known about it prior to joining Endgame, but I found it quite helpful anyway. I had practiced a little, though I was still nervous about trying to utilize Psy properly. In that moment, it was like the world opened up. My awareness of the surrounding Psy magnified, and I was just thankful the next section of the journal was a description of reverse cages and how to use them to block things out. I couldn't imagine being bombarded by full awareness of your surroundings all the time. Having a wide sphere which could penetrate walls and distance could be disastrous. I'd already said many quiet apologies for accidental spying just since I started practicing. Whoops. Yeah, she didn't have that problem in the mansion. <laughs> No doubt I'd have been paranoid about being spied on if knowing how to utilize a reverse cage hadn't given me some measure of confidence I'd be aware if someone was watching me. I was still trying to get the hang of it, though. With a surreptitious glance around the room, I lowered my defenses just to... see. There weren't many people at this time of day when most had work, but a couple of adults and some children were loitering around or playing. Nearly all were espers. Ooh, look at everybody's color. Keen awareness of everyone in the room bled into my consciousness the moment I lowered the reverse cage. If Sylvia perceived Psy as waves in harmony, I perceived it as color. Yes, that is very vivid now. The colors varied from person to person in shade, tint, vibrancy, and even complexity of form. I wasn't sure what it meant, but instinct told me that vibrancy and complexity correlated with strength and ability. My own, which took some time to figure out how to see, was bright, but colorless, and it swirled around me in constant motion. What I hadn't learned yet was how to make it mimic someone else. The journal talked about synchronization, but I wasn't sure how to apply that to color. And it wasn't what I wished to work on for now, anyway. I had mimicked abilities in the past, but I imagined I wasn't to the point of being able to do it on command. Not safely, anyway. Not if I didn't want some unexpected result like teleporting myself to some strange location. So I decided to not work on mimicry yet. I set aside the journal and looked at the teacup on the table in front of me. Then at the spoon sitting nearby, because I didn't want to risk lifting something breakable and still holding liquid. Learning to move my sigh around was a bit like trying to learn to walk from scratch. If I thought too hard, I had no real idea where to begin. And the more I tried to deconstruct it, the more I struggled. So I had to just let it happen naturally. I imagined my sigh forming a net of energy around the spoon. Realize the truth. There is no spoon. <laughs> then I lifted it, slightly wobbling into the air. The spoon hung there, and as I retracted my focus, I tried to tell it to stay there. It wobbled again, then fell. I only just caught it before it hit the table. Sylvia's journal had introduced the concept of building a sequence of instructions for Psy, almost like a program the Psy could complete on its own. That was how a bishop could maintain a reverse cage without concentrating on it the whole time. I hadn't figured that trick out yet. But I could lift a spoon. So there was that. Well, look at you. Flexing your side muscles like a pro already. I rolled my eyes at the voice that was half teasing and half patronizing as I returned the spoon to its original spot next to the cup. I think we both know this is nothing like a pro, but I'm starting small so I don't destroy a building again. Ah, uh, that supposedly huge cybers you released. I heard about that. Pity I didn't get to see it personally. I saw it from ground zero. 
it wasn't great. <laughs> Rowan smirked as he flopped next to me on the little sofa, propping his feet on the table. Enjoying breakfast? I'm sure it's not quite as gourmet as you're used to. Please. I was a student in New Albion, Rowan. On the day I was captured, all I had in my kitchen was a tin of mixed vegetables and a few biscuits. I'm hardly used to eating gourmet. Though I hadn't known him long, I was already used to Rowan's brand of teasing. I hadn't thought him terribly friendly when we first met, but now at least he seemed to be joking. Mostly. I can't even imagine life as a student. What did you do? Spend most of your time eating mixed vegetables while you buried yourself in books or something? That sums it up more or less, except the mixed vegetables part. Life was mostly comprised of lectures, books, and exams. That sounds like the most boring thing I can imagine. I suppose it's boring if you don't like what you're studying. I enjoyed most of my classes. My words trailed off because I was still struggling to talk about it since whether or not I enjoyed it was a moot point by now. I don't even know how I did on the last exam. One day, girl, I believe you'll find out. And I might never know at this rate. I stopped going to school when I was... 16, I guess. That young? Really? Not everyone has access to a fancy education here. Some of us have to work to support our families. Things like university aren't even a dream. School is a nuisance, and nothing we learn is going to help us survive here. I had noticed a lot of the kids here don't seem to do any sort of formal learning. Why bother? Not like there are any decent schools around here. And virtual classes don't feed anyone. A lot of these kids are on their own. Some probably aren't even in the system anywhere. They're just ghosts as far as the government is concerned. I guess that's not surprising. It's unfortunate, though. Most of us get by without all your fancy classes. That's true. But there's also an obvious lack of specialized skills in Chestershire because no one has access to the resources to learn them. That contributes to some of the problems. Celeste is overstressed because there aren't any skilled doctors to help her. I'm sure that's not good for her. One person can't take care of the entire community alone. Well, the ones who can learn that stuff wouldn't have a reason to stick around too long. Why stay here when they can live a better life somewhere else? That was true, too, but it just added another layer of frustration. This was the place that needed those skills the most. It was hard to even contemplate improving the situation when people were just focused on feeding themselves, and even the children had to work because there was no one to care for them. The sheer inequality of opportunities was staggering, and it became an endless cycle where things could never improve because everyone was just meeting their basic needs. They could never get beyond that, much less work on broader community improvements. And the government just wasn't present enough to help. It was frustrating to witness. They were getting by, as Rowan put it. But that wasn't always enough, was it? So, what did you study in your school over on the day side anyway? Rowan's question pulled me out of my thoughts and back into the conversation. He was leaning closer, grinning as he swiped a piece of toast from my plate. I had a feeling he was expecting me to protest, which made me determined not to. Interplanetary archaeology. His eyebrows went up. Sounds fancy, I guess. That, like, studying fossils and things. Not necessarily. There are some who focus on studying remnants of prehistoric creatures here in Arcalis but that wasn't my area. I was focused more on ancient civilizations, specifically the Senecan people. My goal was to go off-world to research the ruins on Dion. Did we read about them before? Mm. Possibly, but just in case, I'm going to read it again. The Senecan people are the only primitive species that has been identified on Arcalis. They are the subject of much curiosity as every prehistoric cultural center that has been located can be traced back to this single society 
When normally archaeologists would expect to find numerous ancient cultures on a world the size of Arcalis, they were spread all across Arcalis and evidence of their culture has even been found on Dion. There is a great deal of speculation where they came from and whether they originated on Dion or Arcalis, but it is believed that the Araeans were likely the ones to transport them between worlds. There are many groups dedicated to researching them, uncovering the remnants of their society, and trying to decipher their ancient language. Senekin. They're the ones who lived out in the wastes or whatever. They lived everywhere. They don't get quite the attention that the Thalassans and Araeans receive, though. Uh, Thalossan? Thalossan. Thalossan? Thalossan? I'm gonna guess lo Thalossan. The word Thalosan usually refers to the previous occupants of the planet, the ones who built the domed cities and created the planetary AI system. Though Thalosans vacated the planet long before Earthers arrived, some humans remain fascinated with their culture and continue to study what information there is to be gleaned about them. Unfortunately, many of the more interesting historical sites are located in the Twilight region, which is off-limits to researchers due to neutrality laws and treaties. It is suspected there was some sort of planet-wide war that led to the destruction of the Thalosans and their culture, as some of the damage uh, to the biodomes did not appear to be natural disaster related. Due to damages to the planetary AI systems, there was only so much information that could be extracted from it. All of this is said to reside in the Endgame library and archives. Arrayans are an ancient species that little is known about. They inhabited the planet thousands of years before the Thalosans, the Dome Builders. Though evidence of their existence is present across Arcalis, very little is actually known about them beyond the high degree of advancement of their technology. They are believed to have created the Eris Sea by artificial means and are also believed to have artificially tidal locked the planet. Okay, I remember reading this before. They are also responsible for the dangerous relics that occasionally surface. Arrayan ruins dot the surface of the planet and are some of the oldest and most dangerous structures known to the Earth colonizers. Huh. It's not something I ever got much chance to study. Too busy scrounging for meals in the trash and trying not to get killed. I never had the privilege of big fancy dreams like going to study rocks and carvings on another planet. It was a privilege, I agree. One I'm grateful for. And I think it's a shame people here don't have the same privileges. That you didn't have the same privileges. It's not fair. In a better world... Not a better world yet, is it? The yet is the important part, don't you think? Yet is a heavier word than you might think. But isn't that what Kesa is trying to do here little by little? Make it better? Kesa's a good guy. But look around. He hasn't had much luck yet, has he? This place still sucks. I get the feeling Kesa faces a lot of obstacles. It's what happens when you try too hard to play by the rules. Playing by the rules keeps you in the game. Breaking them gets you disqualified, doesn't it? That's why, if you want to make a difference, you have to change the rules entirely. But that isn't always easy to do. And I feel some people here would be way worse off if not for this place. It may not be some grand societal fix yet, but it's made things at least a little better for people, right? Ever the optimist, aren't you? It's better than the alternative of assuming the future is only going to be worse than what we have. I guess I lost my ability to be optimistic a long time ago. I just try to enjoy the moments I have and make them last as long as I can. You two all cozy over here chatting together. I don't know about cozy. Well, I hate to interrupt, but Rowan, I wanted to check if you've heard about the situation with Marco Cortez. I've heard, yes. I think Jack's looking into it right now. Who's Marco Cortez? They shared a look, and I thought for a moment they wouldn't explain, but Celeste sighed and flopped down in a nearby chair. Huh. <sighs> Just a guy. No one special. He showed up about six months ago and seemed to be doing okay. Got a job at a tattoo shop half a sector away that was living in this district. And... 
He disappeared two days ago. Half a sector away. So not the one with the misspelled sign? Not that one. That's the third one in a month. Third person to go missing? Unfortunately. And equally unfortunate is the fact that disappearances don't raise eyebrows here. So there may be some we don't know about. People wander off for a lot of reasons. You can lose track of them easily. How can someone going missing just not raise eyebrows? Like Cell said, it happens. It's hard to keep track of everyone who shows up here in the first place, much less who leaves. People work all over the city, and sometimes they just don't come back. For some, they just picked up and moved on without saying a word. I'm aware of what they say about the court on the day side, but we're not some cult. We're barely even an organized group. So it's not like people have to inform us if they want to leave. We try to keep an eye on who enters our territory, though. But, well, this is a big spread out area, and the borders aren't clearly defined. People slip past us. The point is that it's a lot of people to keep track of, and only a few people are doing the babysitting. If people wander off all the time, then what's the concern? The concern is that sometimes they don't wander off. Sometimes it's more serious. They get involved in a street fight and end up in one of the lousy excuses for a hospital in the city. Or they get picked up by what passes for law enforcement in the upper districts, which is basically to say they just get picked up by a gang that's sanctioned by the city. Sometimes their body turns up somewhere. And sometimes it never does. Human trafficking is a booming industry in Delphine. On the day side, too, from what I understand. They just don't always hide it over here. But for three prominent and contributing members to disappear in a month is pretty unusual. On a given day, it's the stragglers that up and vanish, not people we found work for. Not the ones helping in the community. Which is why we're spreading the word to be careful. To everyone. And that includes you. Don't go anywhere outside this building. Not alone, for sure. I wasn't, anyway. Jack already stressed that I should stick close by for now, and the only time I leave, I'm with him. Good. It should stay that way until we figure out if something more significant is going on. I'll leave you two alone. I'm just trying to let people know. I was about to leave anyway, so I'll come with you. Might be good to check on some of the loners, too. I agree. See ya, Morgan. Hey, he didn't call her a little flower. They left me alone again, and I watched them stop several others and talk to them briefly before they left the lobby. I let out a sigh and took another sip of tea. It wasn't like the rest of the world stopped just because I was having a personal crisis. But it was troubling things like this were commonplace here. All I could do was hope they found the missing people alive and well. Setting aside those thoughts, I finished up my tea and decided to continue practicing for a while to get my mind off things I couldn't fix. But my practice plans were interrupted midway through when a small group of people started clearing out some rooms near the lobby. They were mostly used for storage, I guess. What I gleaned from the conversation was that they intended to clean them for use as more living space. So I left Sylvia's journal on the coffee table and went to help. They were surprised at my offer, but accepted gratefully. Made up of what seemed to be mostly kids quite a few years younger than me, the group was struggling to haul a few broken chairs. Somewhere. I quickly learned it was down to some area beneath the building used for storage, and sometimes dumping rubbish. City maintenance wasn't reliable about picking this stuff up, so they didn't want to take it out to the dumpsters. I carried the things down myself because it gave me an opportunity to practice lifting something more difficult than a spoon with my sigh. Whoa. Wait, isn't this the catacombs? What I had assumed to be a basement was not a basement. For one, it was much larger than expected. My curiosity was instantly piqued. I had to force myself to go back upstairs to retrieve the rest of the broken chairs. On my last trip down, well... I decided to have a look around. Because it looked interesting to explore, and I kind of wanted a break from training and reading. I realized it wasn't a single room. Instead, there was a series of catacombs that went sprawling far beyond just Cordus. 
Even in New Albion, I'd heard rumors about catacombs beneath some cities in Delphine, but there was very little information about them. I hadn't even been sure it was real. I think I read about this on Ari's route. Yeah, the underground. Hmm. You know, I might just read this again because it's been a while. The area known to many as the underground consists of the catacombs and tunnels that lead directly to the underground Arrayan ruins that wind beneath much of the planet. Though the ruins themselves are often referred to separately as the ruins or the labyrinth, the underground is a term used to sometimes refer to the ruins and catacombs collectively. It's unclear who created the catacombs, as their structure differs somewhat from the ruins themselves. They also lack the distinct Arrayan symbols and circuitry that make the ruins so dangerous to explore. For this reason, some believe that the catacombs were built later by the Thelosans to access the ruins. The Arrayan ruins are a vast network of tunnels and structures that delve deep into the planet. They run below many of the cities, and through dayside ru and though dayside ruins are often sealed and blocked off, it's fairly easy to access them on the night side. Arrayan structures are at least partially technology, and usually have extensive circuitry running through them. They react to Psi energy, and are known to activate if an Esper uses Psi in them. I had forgotten that. They can restructure themselves, seal themselves off, or otherwise become hostile to invaders if one isn't careful. Not all the ruins are simply narrow tunnels and empty rooms. They can open up into large caverns filled with alien machinery, and there are rumors of reactor-like chambers deep beneath the surface. Yes, yes, yes. I couldn't believe I was seeing them in person. This place was... beautiful in its own way. One source had said the catacombs were here when the colonists arrived. That would make them thousands of years old. There was so much unspoken history here. Who had created this place? Why? Even if I didn't expect to find ancient carvings and tombs, this was still a treasure. Had the Thelosans made this place? Someone else? Forgetting everything else for a while, I wandered deeper into the shadows. I imagined if anything valuable was down here, it had been removed long ago, but the place itself was interesting enough to captivate me. Knowing I should probably go back, I pressed in a little further anyway. Just a few more minutes. I'd already gone beyond where I imagined the others tended to come, far past the open area where they stowed junk from Cordus. I wonder if there are other openings to this place elsewhere in the city. I could tell I was heading deeper beneath the surface due to the downward slope of the floor, too. How fascinating. Wait... There was something up ahead. A light low on the wall. I quickened my steps, and when I reached it, crouched to inspect. That was... My heart suddenly beating fast, I brushed away some grimy muck, revealing more of the symbols and circuitry. It felt like every breath fled as I stared down at it. Pressing my hand against the wall, I was surprised to find the vibration was stronger. And there was a faint hum as well. A dull ma machine sort of sound. How can this be here? Arrayan symbols? This doesn't make sense. <laughs> Do I activate the defense grid? <laughs> Hmm. What are my traits again? Confident, stubborn, emotional. But is this one of those times I shouldn't be confident? Although, getting ourselves into trouble in Case's route summoned Jack. <laughs> Maybe we're supposed to be getting in trouble. Jack! We've already seen that Jack kind of just reacts and gets himself into trouble often. I assume Morgan is going to be pretty close to that, to that as well. I'm gonna, I'm gonna poke it. I squinted into the darkness ahead. Dimly, I thought I could make out more lights threading into the walls, and perhaps an open space a little way into the darkness. But the faint light from near the stairs didn't reach that far. Bracing myself, I moved in that direction, keeping one hand on the wall. I wish I had a proper light. As I walked, my hand cleared away years of grime from the wall, revealing the pulsing glow of symbols and circuits. I wasn't sure the wall was limestone anymore, either. As if the catacombs were fading into something else. Something more... interesting. 
I stopped short as a blast of icy air hit my face. There was a bigger room opening in front of me. Ah, this one. I couldn't see far into it, but I could see the lights in the walls threading their way into the gloom. Was it... Was it possible this was some kind of complex of ruins? Arrayan ruins. Just lying silently below Cordis as if no one knew it was here. But that couldn't be the case. There was no way no one would know about this. There were so many questions racing through my head. There was excitement as well. Adrenaline bubbled up, and I had to push it down because this couldn't possibly be a new discovery. Others had to know this was here, which begged the question of why they weren't exploring it, studying it. Maybe lack of funding? The good news was that I was here! At the very least, I could look around. A little. I never thought I'd get to see a place like this, and now it was right in front of me. I took an almost instinctive step forward. But from behind me, a hand reached out to grasp my arm. Jack? I let out a yelp and whirled around, already swinging my fist. It connected solidly with... Nothing, as Jack dodged the weak punch. For a moment, I just stared at his features, barely discernible in the weak light. Didn't mean to startle you. I could hear the laughter in his voice. What the hell are you doing down here, Butterfly? Jack, do not sneak up on me like that! Sorry about that. I just didn't want you wandering off and getting lost down here. I'm not going to wander off. I was just looking. He had a point, though. I didn't even have a light with me. But still! You were just looking. Alone. Here. He let out a low, amused laugh. <laughs> You've got a spine of steel if you're willing to run around down here alone. Oh? Scared? Possibly. He took my arm and started guiding me back towards where I'd come from earlier. I followed reluctantly, casting a longing glance over my shoulder. Everyone is scared of this place, Morgan. Except you, evidently. There's nothing to be scared of. It's just an empty tunnel. A very old empty tunnel. It's kind of what I wanted to do with my life, I hope you realize. Run around in dirty underground ruins. Study remnants of early civilizations, yes. Which does sometimes involve running around in dirty underground places. Sounds delightful. Do you know anything about this place? Like, why is it here? Why is no one studying it? There were Arrayan symbols, and... Places like this are everywhere, Morgan. What's to study? It's just endless corridors and creepy-ass rooms with tech that would probably kill you if it got the chance. There has to be more to them than that. I don't know, Morgan. This complex is enormous. They all are. Like I said, they're everywhere. Including on the day side. And I've been in some of them before. I can verify they all kind of look the same. If they're everywhere, how does no one know about them? I've heard things about catacombs under Delphine, but nothing like the scope of what you're saying. And nothing about this kind of thing on the day side. Well, it's not that no one knows about it. The Triad government does. Delphine's government does. Endgame knows. I assume some scientific organizations are aware. Civilians are unaware for the most part. You think anyone wants to know about some creepy alien ruins under their feet? On the day side, the known entrances are guarded and people are kept out. Here, as you can see, that isn't the case. But I guess you could call it an open secret. People know. No one cares. How can they not care? I may not have wanted to study Arrayan civilization, but some people should care. No one is studying this branch of the labyrinth, but other areas have been studied, are being studied. But more interesting places are on the surface. This place is just hallway after hallway. The bigger problem is that it's not safe. When they were mapping out some portions of them on the day side, they lost a few of the exploration teams, 
set off what we can only assume was some kind of security system. A high death count is as good a reason as any to back off and pretend this place doesn't exist, you know. Can't we look around just a little? You and me? We don't have to go that deep. Right this minute. A little? He grinned, shaking his head. Why don't we come back with lights or something at a later date? I don't mind you having a look if you're careful. I think this area is innocuous enough if that's all we do. But you shouldn't go beyond that big room up ahead. You can't expect me to just ignore this. Maybe not. But I hope you don't do anything foolish now that you know the place is here. Because trust me, people aren't scared of this place for no reason. You saw the circuitry going through the walls, right? It's all array and tech down that way. And sometimes array and tech reacts weirdly to Psy. Which makes it extra dangerous for Uspers. Array and tech responds to Psy? I had no idea about that. And setting that aside... Weirdos wander around down here sometimes too. Our reverse cages can't extend down here, so we can't say for sure who or what might be lurking around. I suppose that was a fair point. Though if it was as dangerous as he said, there couldn't be too many lost souls wandering around. Besides, I know the ruins on the day side had a tendency to rearrange themselves. I imagine the ones on this side can do the same. That sounded far-fetched. But with Array and Tech, I was sure it was possible. It's a shame we haven't made better progress studying Array and Technology. As I understand it, people have been studying Array and Tech for years. And we don't understand it any more now than we did when they discovered the first relic. Let's see. Relics are a form of alien technology from a culture that predates the Losin civilization by thousands of years. Known in scientific communities as Arrayans, very little is known about this culture beyond that they once existed and had a profound impact on Arcalis. Their relics are thought to be very prevalent in the oldest ruins found on Arcalis, but most of those locations are highly restricted. Even so, relics occasionally find their way into the hands of a normal citizen, usually with disastrous consequences. Relics are made of an unknown ally called Amidrium the components of which are a mystery and are believed by most to be non-native to our callus, as no known source of them has ever been found. Some secret research facilities, however, have studied and isolated the components. Relics cannot usually be safely handled or studied by most people outside of extremely controlled situations due to their tendency to react to Psy. The use of Psy inhibitors can aid in this regard, but relics have been known to react to even suppress Psy, making their study quite dangerous. As such, relics research is highly restricted in most places, as activating one by accident can have severe repercussions. How they work is unknown, and the technology is so advanced and unpredictable that even groups who have studied them for years know very little about them or the civilization that created them. Hmm. Well, that part is true. But even so, this place is... Let's just go upstairs for now, and you can give some thought to how you want to approach it. At the very least, I would recommend waiting until you're more confident in controlling your Psy. Because if you activate it unintentionally down here, it could get you killed. Fine, fine. Threat of imminent death was probably a good reason to get back upstairs. But I hope you're not expecting me to forget this is down here, because I won't. I'd never assume that. Good. I'm glad we have an understanding. They told me you were helping move some furniture or something earlier. Didn't expect to find you willingly walking to your doom down in the labyrinth. I wasn't walking to my doom. And yes, I was. They were clearing out some rooms and needed help. I guess you're settling in then. I don't have much choice but to settle in, right? That doesn't sound terribly enthusiastic. Sorry. I didn't mean it that way, I promise. Just that I'm here, so settling in is inevitable. It's not like I can mope around forever. I didn't mean to make it sound like... I don't know. I mean, I wouldn't say I'm enthusiastic, but I also don't hate it if that's what you were worried about. 
You don't have to apologize. I know it's not exactly your first preference to be here. I feel like we've had this conversation. Probably have. It's growing on me, this place. I mean, everyone is constantly talking about how dangerous everything is. But the people here seem like... good people. Some of them. Me? Well... I'm not sure I'd go that far. You did just sneak up on me. I'm wounded, Butterfly. I highly doubt that's enough to wound you. There you are! And I see Jack found you. Were people looking for me? What do you think? You suddenly vanished and no one knew where you went. Oh, right. We did just have a talk about people suddenly vanishing. Whoops a daisy. Several people should have known I was helping you move some broken furniture. You weren't down in the storage area. I found her wandering around in the beginning of the Array and Labyrinth. What? What the hell were you doing down there? Studying, apparently. Jack, you neglected to inform us all she's insane. I'm not insane. I'm curious. But I didn't mean to worry anyone. At least we know you're all right. I'll go tell Celeste to stand down. And you, don't go down there again. Yes, Dad. Sorry, Dad. <laughs> he vanished back upstairs. I shot Jack a concerned look. Everyone was that worried? Well, there have been a few disappearances lately, so I think we're all on edge. Don't worry about it too much. You'll find we can all be overprotective when it comes to one of our own. One of our own? Somehow that stirred a surprising feeling in the pit of my stomach. I realized it was... nice to be thought of that way. I'll have to apologize, then. They mentioned the disappearances earlier, and Celeste told me not to wander alone. But I didn't really think of it in terms of the catacombs. It's not your fault. When I heard you had taken some stuff down there, I wondered if you started wandering around. They said you were looking into the disappearance of someone. Marco, I think? Did you find out anything? No, unfortunately. Cases had me looking into the situation, but nothing so far. You don't have to worry about it, Butterfly. You've got enough on your plate right now. It's not possible to not worry about people going missing. I wonder if we can use that reverse cage thing we read about in S Sylvia's journal to find some of these people later. Potentially? Tell me how your training is going. Ah, a not-so-subtle subject change. I lifted a spoon today. Then I lifted some broken chairs. Impressive. Hardly. But I'm trying to take your advice to start small and everything, just until I get the hang of, you know, doing things. It's not terrible advice. I think I'd be more impressed with it if you stopped telling me how amazing it is. I have to keep telling you because it doesn't seem like you notice how amazing I am on your own. Ooh! We got our first affectionate choice, of course. If I haven't noticed it yet, maybe you just haven't been amazing enough. Oh, come on! I saved you! Twice! I'm not sure that first one counts as saving, exactly. I politely walked you home. You also lied about it. For effect? Oh, that was for effect. I thought you just didn't want me to feel bad about your having gone out of your way for me. But it was just to make you look cooler. I understand. You can't deny I saved you the second time, though. And I told you the truth about what was going on when no one else did. Most of the truth. You left out some key details. Only for the sake of brevity, since we were short on time. I got you safely away from everyone chasing you, and brought you to the court exactly as promised. I suppose I concede it is somewhat amazing. I'd be far more amazed if you stepped in before I got kidnapped and spared me that particular harrowing journey. If I did that, you probably wouldn't have believed anything I said. I suppose that's true. 
Wait, are you saying you let me get kidnapped on purpose? I'm going to have to deduct some amazingness points for that. What a tough audience. I couldn't quite keep the amused grin off my face. That was a great conversation. <laughs> These moments were a bit of a bright spot in the middle of everything else. And I couldn't deny I was grateful to Jack. For a lot more than just saving me that day. Not that I tell him that. Because he was far too fun to tease. One thing was certain. If I missed lectures from my mother at all, I got a lovely taste of home when Celeste found me. And summarily told me off for doing something stupid. She also extracted a promise I would not go to the labyrinth again anytime soon. And definitely not alone. Jack spent most of the lecture laughing at me. Which I suppose I might have deserved. Ooh, hey! New bathroom. Lovely. I like that tub. Jack and I spent the rest of the evening after dinner discussing the journal. He gave me a few pointers as well. His views on how Psy worked aligned... Oh, sorry. Okay, I'm like, how am I reading this? His views on how Psy worked aligned to his sisters pretty closely, even though he admitted it wasn't necessarily how it was commonly taught. I wasn't sure if it was from reading the journal himself, or just because they had discussed it while she was alive. I thought about that while taking a shower and preparing for bed later on. That and my earlier conversation with Rowan. As I tipped my head back, I couldn't help but feel that this place was already... winding itself into me, already becoming part of my experience. It wasn't bad. It wasn't what I planned, and it wasn't what I'd wanted. But somehow, it wasn't bad. At first, it had felt like a dead end, a place I'd come to be forgotten. But I was starting to get a sense of... of... possibility. There were things I hadn't even considered here, that I never could have imagined. Like finding those ruins. It wasn't a dead end. It was just another path. One unfamiliar and certainly unplanned. That was frightening. And exciting. It was like the night sky. Open, boundless, unknown. And maybe a little beautiful. I was looking forward to it. Thank you.